All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Normally, I like to give everyone a couple of minutes or so to get logged in and settled, but we promised a 30 minute event today and I want to be respectful of all of your time. So I'm going to get right into it. Uh, first things first, my name is Samantha and I am Talon's marketing manager. And again, I just like to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for our water utility reporting and analytics webinar. The story and presentation we have for you today will hopefully be as exciting for you as it is for us. So if you look on the right hand side of your screen, there are a couple of opportunities to engage. We have both a chat and a Q&A pane. Um, my colleagues and I will both be reviewing this throughout the event. So if you have a question about data sources, integrations, or any of the demos that we're gonna share, please feel free to comment or question at any time. Um, we will be sure to interrupt if it's appropriate. Otherwise, we're gonna try and hold questions until the end. Um, if for some reason we run out of time, the questions will save and we will personally um, get you an answer as soon as possible. We are going to be recording today's event, so we will get the link out to you later this afternoon so you can review it if you wish or share it with colleagues who may not have been able to attend. Um, so now I'm going to get right into it. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Jared Brown is the Vice President of our Data and Analytics Practice at Talon. He has over 20 years of experience and his team developed this solution. So now I'm going to let him take it away and tell you all about it. So Jared, the proverbial floor is yours. Thank you, Sam, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, pleasure to see so many people in attendance today. All right. <clears throat> um, we're definitely excited to share some of our recent innovations in the area of water and sewer um, innovation um, in this industry. So uh, before we actually get started, I'm gonna take a couple minutes and explain a little bit more about Talon. Uh, simply stated, uh, Talon is a technology um, consulting company with a focus on enabling companies mature their organizations through digital innovation. Uh, this is made possible by um, the different practice areas at Talon, including user experience, application development, cloud, and of course, data and analytics. Uh, we're at a crossroads of technological advancement. Uh, we now have the tools um, to take advantage of um, these new data sets in ways that we had never um, previously considered. So with the progression of that digital age, more and more of our customers uh, are looking to leverage data analytics to drive innovation. Um, as we embark on these projects with our customers, we're leveraging our experience to look for those opportunities. So whether you know we're using new data sources, taking advantage of the modern data platform to enable analytical initiatives or um, operationalizing those insights to drive the business forward. <clears throat> Most organizations are starting this analytical journey uh, with an operations focus. You know, looking at what happened and why to um, you know to determine if they could use um, those hindsights to increase operational efficiency. So that could be um, customer service um, and engagement um, systems. Uh, workforce and equipment planning um, data sources or financial and account uh, accounting based reporting. Um, but as more and more people start to see the value that's associated with that data, uh, they're going to want to create more reports and share um, more than just the report themselves. Uh, they're now looking to share um, those semantic or business models, uh, those data sets that include not just the data, but the relationships and calculations with their peers so that they could take advantage. Um, so with this increasing interest um, in that data, um, there's an increasing dependency on those insights. Um, so it's becoming more important to, to sure up these processes, make sure they're repeatable through process orchestration um, and scheduled refreshes. Um, you know, you'll find that it quickly becomes necessary to impose um, a well thought, thought out governance strategy as you're kind of approaching uh, this um, employee enablement and trying to foster the adoption um, of these enterprise level analytics. Um, so that everybody in the organization is then empowered to make data-driven decisions um, using data that they can trust, which is really important. Um, it's at that point that companies um, can strategically invest in these initiatives um, that are truly transformative and start to provide foresight um, and control the future. Uh, it's in this area that, you know, Talon can certainly help you. Okay. So. 
I'm going to talk about a few um, of those more business dis distinguishing examples um, and kind of a progression, um, you know, some examples of things that we're doing for other companies like yours. Um, so one of the uh, examples I wanted to share is uh, water quality monitoring, right? So you're taking um, perhaps SCADA data, capturing it, um, performing some analysis um, on that so um, that uh, operators can take corrective action if there is, you know, some kind of issue with the water quality itself based on that analysis. Uh, we're also seeing, um, you know, people pulling in other sources of data like customer service information. So when a customer calls the call center and is complaining about um, an issue with the water quality, you know, an odor or something along those lines, that could be paired with this other information to see if there's something um, that is causing that issue and it can be addressed. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is meter reading or AMI uh, analysis. Um, so if you're um, you know, leveraging systems that capture this information electronically or already, or in some cases, uh, the manual reads as well, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was allow our customers to look for anomalies in that data. Um, you know, based on uh, historical usage patterns for particular customers, or um, looking at um, similar customers, you know, so um, like hotels, laundromats, um, customers with similar commercial use codes that um, can serve as like a reference when you're looking um, at the data um, to see if there is some deviation that might be an indication of um, a degradation um, in a uh, meter itself that needs to be replaced or an indicator that there might be some improper use such as um, you know, illegal bypass or, or something along those lines. Um, there's also an opportunity to innovate in this area as well and provide additional value adds to customers. Um, you know, speaking from personal experience, I had a scenario where um, the supply line to a toilet tank in my home broke, water was running for hours, I didn't, you know, have an indication that was the case. You know, maybe there's ways to uh, enable scenarios like that. I know there's third parties that have devices that um, do that already. Um, but maybe this is something um, that could be provided um, as a, a proactive way to engage um, cu customers in a kind of more central way. Okay, and then the last is preventative maintenance. And this is an area we're seeing incredible interest in across verticals. So, um, you know, equipment um, you know, functions and, and things along those lines in manufacturing. Um, but in this case, you're taking um, information about um, you know the the assets themselves, and 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 trying to use that historical data to determine what might occur in the future. So corrective action could be taken, uh, maybe mitigating um, um, uh, a, a mitigation uh, strategy before a catastrophic failure occurs on a, a water main, um, which could cost millions of dollars to fix. Or, or something um, that addresses uh, potential system overflows that could cause um, environmental disasters or EPA fines. Okay, um, so as you undertake each of these types of initiatives and you start to build out this modern data estate, every new source of data, every interaction with that data in the data lake, it, it creates an opportunity to reuse and potentially combine that with other information, other sources, ways that were uh, perhaps previously not considered. Um, so maybe other departments within in the organization start to see value and they want to participate and contribute to that growth. Um, so with the, the elastic scale of the cloud and you know, support from the right tools, um, you'll find that you'll soon be embarking on you know, additional data-driven initiatives um, before you know it. Um, that's exactly what we did for a recent customer of ours. Um, and uh, I'd like to actually share that story. Okay, um, so the client that I mentioned is the, the DC Water Authority, and we've been working with them for a little over uh, six months now, um, and you know, continuing to have additional um, engagements. Um, uh, you can see here they provide drinking water, wastewater collection, water treatment, um, and a number of other services. Uh, you know, a, a, a fairly large water authority and um, handling large volumes of 
um, you know, drinking and wastewater, um, as you could see here. Uh, their mission um, is to is to I quote exceed expectations by uh, providing high quality water services in a safe, environmentally friendly, and efficient manner. Um, but in general, they're an organization that's you know has a culture of innovation. So uh, they're very excited to kind of undertake some of these initiatives. Uh, their goals coming into some of the um, you know uh, engagements that we've had with them were to you know overall reduce the cost to serve. Um, provide better resource management and improve re reliability and quality of the services that they provide. In this particular scenario, they wanted to achieve that through a, a few different areas, taking a variety of um, data sources that they already had in-house, asset management, ERP systems, uh, SCADA, uh, AMI systems, bring all that data together in a single area so it was available, um, and some new sources. We pulled in weather data, um, traffic data, and we'll, we'll kind of get into a few of those examples. Um, they also wanted to use AI technology, so machine learning to do that predictive analysis um, and you know, determine when water mains might break. Um, but in all situations, you know, ultimately, you know, there's human involvement, and they wanted to make that um, information available through a rich data visualization layer, um, you know, something that was interactive and allowed them to take action on any of the insights that were made available. I do want to mention, um, actually, just this week, the uh, it was announced by Microsoft that you know due to our you know investment and uh, DC Water's investment in this project, uh, we were actually named a finalist in the um, Power BI category of Partner of the Year. So really exciting, um, um, you know, designation that Microsoft um, gave, and uh, you know, uh, DC Water's response to this was actually you know great. You know, let's continue to innovate. You know, we'll do it again next year. Okay. So one of the things I like to stress is, you know, getting started can be kind of intimidating at times, especially if you're, you know, kind of charting on tar uh, un traveling uncharted waters, right? So getting started, you know, doesn't necessarily have to feel like drinking from a fire hose, right? Um, you shouldn't feel like you have to have a fully defined architecture in order to get started. Power BI itself is meant to be um, very user friendly. It has its roots in Excel really easy for people to pick it up and start doing some prototyping of their own. There's a lot of resources available to learn. Um, but it also ends up becoming a very robust um, platform for providing business intelligence to the organization. So um, it really kind of matures with your organization, um, which is fantastic. <clears throat> so DC Water took that exact approach, right? They started um, an engagement with Microsoft and Microsoft brought us, you know, Talon in as a partner. Um, but within a few weeks of being engaged, uh, we actually had delivered um, something, um, you know, that was potentially usable by them and, um, you know, and, and is still in use today. We started with a very simple architecture. Uh, you can see here, we took sensor data from their SCADA system. Uh, we used Azure Data Factory initially to, to pull that in periodically and drop it in a data lake. Um, from there, we enriched the data with um, some time series forecast information so that they can um, you know, kind of predict what is going to happen with some water quality levels in the future. And then we presented that information in Power BI. Uh, for those that don't know, um, a data lake, you could kind of think of it as um, you know, a folder structure that's made available in, in the cloud, like a, a network share of sorts, where you can drop files in these hierarch hierarchical folders, um, you know, CSV files, image files, really it's meant to support a variety of types of data. In this case, we use simple CSVs, as you'll see in a minute, um, but what really becomes powerful is what you could do with that data um, after you bring it into the lake. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into a demonstration. Um, let me go ahead and find that screen and pull it over. All right. Okay, so what you can see here is ultimately what we um, produced um, as kind of the way to visually um, um, deliver some of this information to um, you know, DC Water and their operations team. 
You can see here we have a number of pump stations. We picked three of them to start and some different um, points of data that we wanted to um, provide insight into um, in, in kind of a visual interactive way. So right now we're looking at the Anacostia pump station um, and presenting some of the pH readings. Um, kind of looking down here, you can see um, this is two weeks of uh, readings um, with the median for every single hour. And we have a forecast that you see um, at the very end. Um, and this forecast is for the next 24 hours. I could switch between you know, turbidity or chlorine and show a variety of different um, points of information. Um, the other thing that you might notice is that we have this gray line coming, kind of going back in time. This is the hindcast, or, or well, I guess technically it was the forecast that we had created in previous um, iterations. We wanted to keep that around so we could see, you know, how well you know we were doing. And not only that, but I can drag this slider back, and you can kind of see on any given day, um, you know, what the forecast looked like. Um, so this was kind of nice to have the ability to go back in time and see uh, what information was available. Um, also worth mentioning um, that we did add um, some operating range information. So um, based on um, historical usage, um, or sorry, not historical uses, historical readings, you could see the operating range we, we added um, you know, with these dotted lines. I mean, there's a lot of different opportunities to provide additional information here. I think these were based on um, a certain uh, you know, uh, deviation from you know, the, uh, the median, but um, uh, you know, ultimately what we you know, created allowed us to have conversations with that, that end user. And um, you know, we thought it was really nice that they can switch between these pump stations and have the nice visual. Her response was, I'm more interested in the data. So get rid of the visual and make all the other graphs bigger, um, which was fine. It was great. But, you know, I kept this one around because, you know, I, I like to, to add that little bit of um, uh, element of uh, uh, kind of visual appeal to it as well. Okay. So the one other thing that I want to show um, on this one is a little bit about what's happening behind the scenes. And there's a couple of things that I'm going to do to, to show this. Um, you know, first, to show the data that's actually in the data lake is right here. And I'm just, for right now, opening Azure Synapse Studio, which is a tool that lets me very easily browse the data setting in the data lake. Um, you'll see in a, in a little bit some of the other tools that we used um, that that have um, uh, a part to play in the overall uh, platform. So you can see here the CSV files I was talking about. This is Alaska Street. I could click on one of these and say preview. And there you go. There's the data that's sitting in my data lake by hour, the different readings. I also have the ability to take these CSVs and store them in a different format in the data lake. Um, so we use um, Azure Databricks to do our data ingestion, transformation, and uh, manipulation of the data for other parts of the application. Um, but I did it here just to, to provide a simple example. And I created um, this folder structure that you see here. Um, this is in my little sandbox area, where I have the Anacostia pump station um, the, the specific year and month as folders. And you can kind of see that if I come back here, you know, so I can pick um, these folders. And there's this Parquet file. And don't worry, you don't necessarily need to know what Parquet is behind the scenes. Just understand that it's meant for really um, quick analysis. Um, so I can right click on that and say, select the top, um, I probably should have run this before, but select the top 100 rows from, from that file. And um, it might take a second to load. Yeah, there you go. So there's the first 100 rows um, directly um, here in the studio. Um, I also could go in and say, well, I want to see, um, let's see. Actually, I think I might have already written this query. I could come in. Yeah, let's just do that just for the sake of time. I just put a star here. I said, I want all files for all months. And I want to do the, I want to grab the month. Um, average chlorine and average pH. Um, and I could run this as well. So this is running against, you know, uh, oh, I was highlighting that. Sorry about that. Um, 
this is running against all those files, a file every single day for the uh, entire year to date, and it's going to do this aggregation. So really easy to kind of explore the data, which is fantastic. Um, OK, um, I'm going to come back in a little bit and talk about Databricks, uh, which is another piece of the overall solution that we will get into in the next demo. But um, you know, just wanted to show here how you have the ability to kind of uh, explore the data in a very uh, interactive way, uh, very uh, dynamically. OK, so let me go back to the slides. OK, next slide. All right, so now that you've mastered that fire hose and you want to move on to the next initiative, um, you, you know, you're going to want to use a slightly more robust architecture, something that scales um, and, and provides additional capabilities. And that's exactly what we did for DC Water as well. Um, you'll see a lot of common themes from the, the previous slide. Um, Notice we're bringing in a lot more data, so not just meters and customers, SCADA, AMI reads, even some uh, third-party data sources, so GIS shapefiles with traffic data, weather data. All this can land in the data lake, and we could process that data there. We use Azure Databricks as a platform to do that ETL. Um, it's fantastic because it gives um, a variety of users the ability to participate um, in the, the overall experience. So. Your ETL developers can use um, you know, Databricks to do that. Um, your data scientists can use Databricks to do those uh, predictive models, machine learning, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the data is kind of moves its way through a structure in the in the data lake before it's either loaded into a data warehouse for consumption or um, made available directly to reporting tools like I just showed. So this is actually the folder structure of the data lake that we uh, developed for DC Water. Um, you can see here that the data moves through a progression of folders from a raw area to a staging area to a curated area with each step um, additional refinement occurring. So data quality, you know, as many of you know, is, is really critical to um, successful business analytics. Um, so this is how that data is cleansed, combined. It moves through that progression. Without this structure in place, um, you're bound to create what people call a data swamp. So it's really important to understand um, how you want to store this data. Some people call the stages bronze, silver, and gold, but same basic idea. When the data gets to the curated area, it's ready for consumption um, from a, a business um, perspective with tools like Power BI. Um, and you can load it into a data warehouse or connect directly to the, the data lake using a, a pattern called the, the data lake house, which sounds fantastic. Um, it really is, actually. Um, and then the other option is data scientists. They like to work with the less refined data you know, before it's been modified so that they can do some of their own feature engineering um, and manipulation and using tools that they're already comfortable with, like RStudio. So um, data scientists sometimes will use a tool like RStudio to work directly um, in an experimentation area of the data lake um, against that more raw or staged data. Um, mind you that. A lot of that code from our studio is portable into Azure Databricks, and they could run and operationalize those jobs there. Um, so there's a lot of options. And notice the dot 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 implying that you know any tool really can participate in this um, architecture because it is so open. <clears throat> OK, um, so the machine learning process that we used for DC Water, um, it's illustrated quick uh, here um, you know, at a very high level. I don't want to spend a lot of time because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. But um, the first and most important thing is understanding uh, the question that you want to answer. Because if you have too broad a question or too narrow, you're really not going to get um, the results that you're you know, hoping for. So this is the question that we posed for DC Water. We brought in a variety of other data sources, including third-party weather data um, you know, and the historical breaks, of course. So we could look at all those historical breaks over time and try to predict when something was going to break in the next six months. Um, the algorithm that we use is called the logistic regression. And we just picked this because it's a little less black box than some of the other algorithms. You can kind of see what's going on. Um, it it comes out with a number between zero and one, you know, between you know no break and yes break, and you can almost drag a little slider along this line um, to control, you know, how you know sensitive it is, um, like you know uh, how how 
how specific do you want to be in terms of something that really looks like it's going to break versus a little less likely uh, to do so? OK, and for a demonstration here, let me bring this back over. All right. So this is a report we put together to take the results of that machine learning and present them to the users. And worth noting, this wasn't originally something we were going to do. We were just going to create those predictions and leave the data in the data lake. But how do you then act on it if you can't visualize it? People like to see the data. So uh, we threw this quick Power BI report together um, at the end of the project. Um, just a couple things to mention. Like I can cross filter, and if I'm looking at you know water mains that are purely you know steel, um, you know a lot less likely um, to break. Uh, cast iron, if you're thinking about you know corrosion and rust, uh, a lot more likely to break. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, you know, if we're looking at data in the last, things installed in the last 100 years, far fewer than things that are older. And it's incredible to think that, you know, DC Water has infrastructure that's been around um, for this long, you know, and obviously they're taking, you know, appropriate measures to make sure it's safe, but uh, really kind of incredible. So, um, you know, from here, we, you know, gave them the ability to drill deeper in um, and I look at the, the history. I'm not going to jump into that today. Um, and with the very little time I have left, I just want to show you, um, you know, quickly some of the um, code and output that our data scientists created to support this predictive model. Um, notice we're pulling in, well, you're not going to be able to pick all this up in the, in the few seconds we have here. But notice that, you know, he's documented this directly in line in this notebook. So you can kind of see his thought process and how he, uh, did some of that analysis. Um, from here, you know, we train the model, create the output, write it back to the data lake so Power BI can visualize it again. Um, happy to go in more detail to this uh, uh, on this process since we don't have that much time uh, on another occasion. But uh, did want to mention, you know, that Databricks was a key part of the overall solution for not just the machine learning and predictive analytics, analytics, but also uh, the data ingestion. Okay. <clears throat> Um, before we jump to questions, the one other thing I do want to mention is uh, we'd like to host a executive roundtable. So, you know, let us know if you're interested in joining us and your peers to discuss common issues, ideas, initiatives, you know, things that might be possible based on the data that you're looking to leverage. Um, happy to, um, you know, uh, you know, send out that invite and get you know uh, a number of uh, thought leaders together to kind of discuss. OK, so with that and sorry, the two minutes we have left, um, you know, wanted to open it up to questions if there are any. I don't see questions or a couple of chats here. Nothing yet. OK, so one question is um, how, to, how to determine focus areas to prioritize for this project. So that's a great question. Um, we actually had like six or seven ideas originally. I mean, and most of those were the you know the product of you know the thought leaders at DC Water. Um, but really, what they ultimately did is looked at not just the challenges themselves, but the value that they were going to provide to the organization and um, you know all their customers. So. Uh, we picked the water quality one because that is, you know, obviously critical. Uh, the main break one because that is, um, um, you know, potentially, you know, uh, expensive if, if there's a, a large main break that goes unnoticed and also uh, creates disruption. And then the last was um, a large meter degradation because um, they were focused um, in this case on revenue, actually a very insightful comment that was made by uh, somebody on the DC water team, when they purchase water, you know, um, they're getting it at like a wholesale cost and then they provide it to um, customers at a, um, you know, a cost that represents everything that they need to support from operations, delivery, distribution. Um, so there is a markup there. So the water on the, um, the last, you know, um, step of the process as it goes into the residence or um, or company is worth potentially many times more than the water that they buy um, directly from the, the supplier. So um, focusing on areas where they're losing water there directly impacts the bottom line because it is 
actually a higher opportunity, or uh, I don't say opportunity cost, a higher value than the water elsewhere in the system. So yeah, great question. Okay. There's one more, Jared, if you go over to the questions tab. Okay, yep. Yeah, so in terms of the uh, delivery for the project, uh, we start. We are first engaged with DC Water, I think, in October last year, and you know the holiday in there, and um, you know a pandemic started somewhere in the mix. But uh, we had delivered the initial iteration, I think, in February. Um, so it was really four calendar months, um, maybe more like three um, business months of of time before we delivered the first um, iteration of those three projects, and. DC asked us to come back and add some additional um, value. So it is really possible to turn um, these solutions around quickly in, you know, initial pilots, you know, basically getting um, some initial business value prototyping pilot engagements um, done very quickly. Okay. It helps make informed decisions by use case. Can you share use cases that are up and running um, and in the pipeline? Um, so there's the three use cases that I talked a little bit about um, so far, the you know water quality, um, the large meter monitoring, and the main breaks. Um, some others that we've discussed, sanitary system overflow. Um, you know, if there's a lot of rain and um, a lot of load on the system due to that. Um, certain um, infrastructure combines the, the storm water and wastewater and it creates additional burden. So like DC, for instance, processes all the rainwater in situations like that. Um, the other scenario that's come up for another customer of ours, they wanted to focus more on work orders. So rather than you know some of the things that we had done from a um, water distribution perspective, they wanted to focus on fixes and uh, that. So we, we tied into their asset management ERP systems uh, to kind of, um, you know, focus on that as, as well. So that's a great point. You know, the things that we talked about today are not, you know, what you should kind of constrain yourselves by. We like to approach projects with like an art of the possible mindset. So, you know, feel free to reach out if there's something that wasn't mentioned, but you think would be valuable. We're happy to discuss that as well. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it looks like some people are uh, planning to make uh, some uh, investments in the future. So, you know, that's absolutely great. Um, you know, DC is definitely very much a, a thought leader in the space and, and very focused on innovation. And uh, we're seeing this as a, a trend. A lot of other, um, you know, water and sewer authorities are, are making similar investments. Um, and, and it's not just this, it's, it's across, uh, excuse me, across the, um, well, the board, really. I mean, from the commercial space, public space, um, um, you know, it's it's definitely a new era in terms of data and analytics. I've been very busy. I can I can certainly attest. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate everybody joining today. Um, and again, uh, we'll probably reach out to ask if if you know, among other things, you're interested in attending on that executive um, roundtable. And um, you know, feel free you know to reach out in the meantime if you have any questions. Want to go in a little bit more depth? I know we were incredibly rushed today, and, and thanks for staying a couple minutes minutes after. Um, you know, it's it's really kind of exciting to cr work on these projects that are you know transformative and and providing value to not just companies but um, you know the citizens as well. So um, you know, take care everybody, and and thanks again.